Before we get into the rest of today's video, I just want to say thank you to our wonderful sponsor, Established Titles. Established Titles is an excellent project based on the historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lords and ladies. They allow you to buy as little as one square foot of dedicated land in Eddleston, Scotland, so that you can call yourself a lord or a lady. You get an official certificate and crest. It means that you can officially change your prefix to lord or lady on your credit card, plane tickets, and even on your dating profile. Another amazing aspect is that established titles plant a tree with every order. They work with global charities such as One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support reforestation efforts around the world. It makes a wonderful gift for your loved ones. Established titles even offer couple packs that come with adjoining plots of land. Established Titles told me that the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot, within walking distance. We can build our own criminal core kingdom. They are running a massive sale. Plus, if you use the code CCORE10, you get an additional 10% off. The link you can use is the one you see on the screen right now, and it's the first link in the description. Feel free to click on it and help support the channel. 35-year-old Jeannie Childs lived in Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1993. She was a sex worker. On June 13, neighbors from an adjacent unit in Jeannie's apartment complex complained of bloody water leaking from Jeannie's residence. Her body was then found in the bathroom shower. She had been stabbed 65 times, mostly around her neck and torso area. Investigators found male DNA on Jeannie's comforter, bathroom towel, and bathroom sink. Other than the DNA that investigators could not do a lot with, because DNA technology was not that advanced back in 1993, investigators did not have much to go on. Police called it a horribly difficult case to crack, with so few leads and no witnesses at all. In 2018, officials reopened Jeannie's case. The break investigators needed soon followed in 2019, when police matched the DNA from the crime scene to 52-year-old Jerry Westrom with the use of genetic genealogy. He had not been previously a suspect in the case and was a married father of two adult children from Asante, about 40 miles north of Minneapolis. Investigators discovered that he had lived in the Twin Cities area from 1991 to 1993 and had multiple contacts with law enforcement, including a 2016 conviction for solicitation. In 2019, investigators tailed Westrom to a hockey game where he ordered a hot dog from a concession stand. Investigators then collected one of Westrom's discarded napkins and obtained his DNA, which was determined to match the DNA found at the crime scene. He was arrested shortly thereafter. He long denied having contact with Jeannie or any other women in all of Minneapolis, claiming to have no idea why his DNA was found at the crime scene. In 2022, his trial started. On August 25, 2022, 56-year-old Jerry Arnold Westrom was found guilty by a Hennepin County jury for taking the life of Jeannie Childs. Westrom is expected to appear for a formal sentencing hearing in the next few weeks, and it's expected that he will be handed a life sentence. Hennepin County attorney Mike Freeman said, My condolences go out to the victim and her family. They have had to live without justice for nearly three decades. I hope this brings some sense of closure to them. Today's guilty verdicts show that we will pursue convictions for serious crimes, even if it takes years to gather evidence. Jeannie's mother, Betty Eichmann, was in the courtroom when Westrom was found guilty. This is what she had to say. I know that the law was finally going to take care of him for what he did, and I hope he can sleep at night. Jeannie was a wonderful person, even though she had problems. She had a big heart. Twenty-two-year-old Heather Hodges lived in Rocky Mountain, Virginia in 2012. She was a college student and just recently became a mother. Heather dated Paul Ravens Jordan. Jordan reported Heather missing on April 11, 2012. This was two days after she had last been seen by her family members. Jordan claimed to get Heather a blizzard at a nearby Dairy Queen around 10.30 p.m. on April 9th, but she was gone when he got home. Her sister had dropped her off at the couple's house around 6.30 a.m. that day after Heather had spent a few days staying with her family. Jordan immediately became a person of interest in Heather's disappearance. He had been arrested on April 5, 2012, less than a week before Heather disappeared, on misdemeanor charges for an attack on Paula Hodges, Heather's mother. Jordan had thrown a chair and metal toys at her before chasing her out of the couple's home with a baseball bat. Jordan was ultimately convicted in that case in July of 2012 and given a one-year suspended sentence. 
He had also been previously convicted in 2007 of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Jordan was arrested in an unrelated incident in July of 2017. He pleaded guilty to abduction by force or intimidation in June 2018 and received a 10-year sentence. This just showed investigators that this worthless individual was definitely capable of taking Heather's life. Since that time, the investigation has continued yielding additional evidence of Jordan's involvement in Heather's disappearance and her demise, although her body has not yet been located. In April of 2022, 49-year-old Paul Reavens Jordan was indicted by a grand jury for taking Heather's life and concealing her body. The Franklin County Sheriff's Office said this in a statement, We would like to express gratitude for the members of the Office of the Sheriff, past and present, who have worked diligently over the past 10 years on this case to bring justice and provide closure to Ms. Hodges' family and loved ones. Heather's disappearance has always been an active investigation and has never been considered a cold case, the statement added. Heather's sister, Crystal Songer, said, There's never been any doubt in my mind that it was him. Over the past decade, Songer said she's fiercely advocated for justice on her sister's behalf. If she was still here today, and this would have happened to somebody else, just say, she would be standing right here beside me ready to fight just as hard as I am, she added. No further information was immediately released by law enforcement regarding what specifics led to the indictment. Jordan is currently being held at Green Rock Correctional Center. He had been previously expected to be released in February of 2025. Anyone with further information as to the whereabouts of Hodges' remains is urged to contact investigators at the Franklin County Sheriff's Office by calling 540-483-0000. 26-year-old Anna Kane lived in Reading, Pennsylvania in 1988. She was a sex worker and drug user. Anna had three children. On October 23, 1988, Anna's body was found in a wooded area near Redding, with bailing twine around her neck. An investigation revealed that she had been strangled elsewhere and dumped in the woods. In February of 1990, about 15 months after Anna's life was taken, a local newspaper, the Redding Eagle, received an anonymous letter from a concerned citizen with information that only the perpetrator would know. The letter writer also left his DNA when he licked the envelope. Investigators analyzed Anna's clothing and found traces of an unknown male's DNA. The Pennsylvania State Police have declined to release the 1990 letter to the newspaper or to elaborate on exactly what it said. There were just intimate details about where she was disposed of, how her clothes were displayed, stuff like that, State Police Trooper Daniel Woomer said. This led investigators to believe that whoever wrote the letter had committed the crime. They later determined that the male DNA on Anna's clothing matched the DNA on the envelope from 1990, confirming investigators' belief that the person behind the letter was the perpetrator. But while the investigators had his DNA profile, there was nothing to identify him because he had never been arrested for anything that required his DNA to be put into the system. That's where genetic genealogy came in. Genetic genealogy's effectiveness in cold cases depends on the quality of crime scene DNA and whether it has degraded. The detective's careful preservation of DNA evidence in 1988 provided a solid foundation for today's investigators to examine with new technology. Genetic genealogy combines DNA evidence and traditional genealogy to find biological connections among people. In recent years, companies like 23andMe and Ancestry.com have encouraged people to explore their genealogy by spitting into a tube and sending it off for analysis. These companies then send back information on their clients' ethnic heritage, genetic health risk, and family tree, as well as a raw data file on their DNA. With millions of users seeking to explore their genetic roots, the practice has become a big business. It is also a valuable tool for law enforcement officers to solve old crimes. DNA collected from crime scenes can now be uploaded to an online service that compares it to DNA submitted by people using companies like 23andMe to explore their genealogy. If a possible match is found, genealogists can build out family trees to help find potential suspects. Finally, in August 2022, Pennsylvania State Police used genetic genealogy testing to identify the man responsible for taking the life of Anna Kane. Pennsylvania State Police Nathan Trait said, All of that stuff was preserved the way it should be because they knew probably somewhere down the line whatever they collected could be that little piece of evidence to solve the case. Well, here we are in 2022 and that little piece of evidence that they collected was exactly what we needed. 
The person responsible is a local man named Scott Grimm. Grimm passed away in 2018 at age 58. Investigators don't know much about him other than he lived in a nearby Hamburg, Pennsylvania area. Investigators are trying to determine whether he knew Anna and have urged anyone who knows the nature of their relationship to reach out. So far, they have found no ties. Anna's daughter, 43-year-old Tamika Reyes, spoke during the press conference. She was just nine years old when her mother was taken away from her. I felt a bit of everything when I found out. I was happy to finally put a face behind the monster who took her from us and upset that he will never be able to face consequences. Tamika said one of her fondest childhood memories was taking walks with her mother and seeing her suddenly dance to random music playing in stores as they passed. She was a firecracker, very outgoing, not afraid of anything, very honest, blunt, and caring. Tamika says she's still bothered by the image the media painted of her mother. Although she had a dark past that included drug use and prostitution, she was trying to turn her life around, Tamika said. She was portrayed as the slain prostitute, like she deserved what happened to her. It was hurtful. She was more than that. She was a victim. She was a mother. She was loved. No one deserves what happened to her. It has been hard growing up without a mom, she said. No child should ever have to grow up without their mom. Tamika still has so many questions she would ask Grimm if he was still alive. Why did he take the life of a young woman who was just trying to take care of her children? And what went through his mind when he learned she had a family that loved her? Tamika knows she'll never get the answers, but she's glad her family finally knows who did it. Now the investigators have identified Scott Grimm, they will review other open cold cases to see if he was involved. On December 5, 2001, 20-year-old Wesley Powell was sitting inside his vehicle at a Wahavo gas station in Birmingham, Alabama. An unknown man then walked up to Wesley's car, stood inside the open passenger door, and shot Wesley a few times. Sadly, he succumbed to his injuries the next day in a hospital. The man fled on foot. Witnesses were able to tell the police that the culprit is a young black male, but unfortunately, no one recognized them and there was nothing else for the investigators to go on. Then, in early 2022, investigators received valuable information regarding the case. It led them to 46-year-old Ricky Witherspoon. Investigators were able to confirm that he was responsible. Witherspoon was arrested on August 19, 2022. He is currently being held at a Jefferson County Jail without bond. During the news conference held by Birmingham Police Department to address the arrest, some family members of Wesley's attended and made a brief statement. Don't give up because at one time, I really did. After 21 years, I did. To see this come to light and give our family some closure, so we can have Christmas dinner like everybody else. Because everybody else was having Christmas dinner and we were burying our son. But the main thing is, don't give up, said Wesley Powell Jr.